And Lord, we thank you for um, our young people, and we thank you for the ways in which um, they are growing, and we pray that they would continue to grow and to thrive. You bless the um, school that has begun for them, and you give to them a hunger to learn and an earnest desire to serve and to know you. We pray for Bob and ask that his test would um, be effective tomorrow in Cincinnati, that um, all that the doctors need to see and to know that they would um, be able to discern and have a good treatment plan for him. And please give peace to both him and Gloria as they go through this season um, together. We know that you are good and you're doing good. We thank you for the goodness um, that Bill gives praise for um, of this church as we have sought to stand with him and his boys um, in, in this challenging season in their lives. And we do pray um, for this unexpected and very challenging word that he's just received about this terrible accident with his coworker, Steve. And Lord, we grieve to hear his wife passing and the fact that he is in the ICU. And we pray, Father, for your mercy on him, that you bring healing to him and give much, um, much strength and wisdom to the doctors and that, Lord, you'd give him the strength to, um, to be able to, to handle the grief that he is going to be enduring. And that this would draw him closer to you. And, Lord, we do desire to seek your face this morning. We thank you for how your word is sufficient for every aspect of our lives. And we pray that you would make us to be a people of wholehearted love. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Just a word of orientation, so we're taking uh, two Sundays, um, last Sunday and then this Sunday, to talk about um, the culturally pressing issue of racism, and what, is the scriptures, what do the scriptures have to say about that important issue in our culture and in our time. And so today will be the last day of that, and then um, next Sunday I will be away, but Pastor Montgomery will begin his foundations class, which will be one of the two classes that will run through the fall. So um, all of you will again gather here in the sanctuary with Pastor Montgomery, and he'll give you kind of a, a taste of what that class is like. And um, he's going to be going through just the core things of the faith. Um, so it should be a really, I think, helpful and encouraging class. Um, and then um, two weeks from now, uh, we'll then have two classes going concurrently. Pastor Montgomery's class downstairs on the foundations and then I will be um, teaching on the Holy Spirit here um, for the fall. So back to our topic from last time, and I do have a handout for you, which I'll distribute later. <laughs> I like your attention. I want to keep your attention. Um, so just a quick review. We, we talked about what is, how, how am I defining ra racism? And I'm trying to put it as much as possible in the categories of the scriptures, um, to show that this is something the Bible talks about. Um, and so I define racism as a particular kind of failure to love our neighbor. Racism is the failure to love our neighbor because we harbor a negative prejudice about their culture, ethnicity, or nationality. Um, so just trying to capture the fact that there can be lots of forms in which racism can take. Um, and we need to be on guard against this. This is um, something, as I talked about last time, where the scriptures have, they have there's no place for this. Um, when we're called to love our neighbor, it's not like, well, love your neighbor, you know, if they look like you, or if they talk like you, or if for they're from the same country as you. On the contrary, one of the most outstanding pictures of love of neighbor in the Bible is the Good Samaritan parable, right? where here's this guy from another nation, another ethnicity. Um, and the, the, the sort of hated Samaritan is the one who reaches across the boundaries to love this guy on the roadside um, who is different from him. Doesn't matter. He still loved his neighbor. And so we talked about the created order um, that God made as having really no place for racism. There is one race, the human race. And in that one race, we are all children of Adam and Eve, and we are all um, image bearers, every single one of us. Um, and so we need to love each other 
um, the great law of love, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no distinction. And uh, so last time I was just talking about how the, the church has had problems in the past with racism. Now I'm going to talk about present failures, um, ways in which we continue as a church, broadly speaking, and also um, even here, um, we struggle with racism. This is not a complete list by any stretch, so, you know, if there's something gaping that I didn't include here, it's, um, it's not like I'm saying, oh, I have, here's everything. But this is just, just to get you thinking, like, why are we doing this class? It isn't just that, oh, there was racism, you know, back in the 1800s. There's racism today, and we have to deal with that, and we have to repent of that where, where necessary. So here are some examples. One person, when I was in seminary, said to me, such and such ethnic group, their churches are so legalistic. Such and such ethnic group, their churches are so legalistic. What is that sin? Making a generalization about an ethnic group's churches. What is that sin? I said, is that sin? Was that sin? Yeah. It's, I think, showing um, a prejudgment about a group, um, an ethnic group, and saying, look, those churches, they're characterized by legalism. Are there surely some you know, particular of those churches that are, um, that are legalistic? Yeah, probably. But so, so is such is true of any, you know, any different group of people. So expecting that someone would be inferior in intellect or character because of their ethnicity, that is an example of one of the present struggles that the church today has with racism. Oh, here's another example. Refusing the person, somebody, the honor and respect they are due because of their ethnicity. Refusing someone the honor and respect they are due that they should have because of their station or their office and refusing that because of their ethnicity. So, example from the present time. A confessionally reformed church appoints an elder the, and they do all due process, you know, <clears throat> nomination, train, training of the man. Um, they, you know, examine him on the session, put him forward for election, and he is duly elected. And he happens to be of a minority ethnicity, not the primary ethnicity of that church. And it later comes out that one of the members of that church says, sorry, I can't support that person's leadership. This has happened in the present time. That somebody has, they, they're saying, I can't support that person's leadership. Why? Because of their ethnicity. That's a problem. Refusing somebody the honor and respect they're due because of their ethnicity. Or here's another one. Thinking of ourselves and our ethnicity as the central and most important one. So think about this, and this is, this is like one of these ways in which racism can be so invisible to us. But just for a moment, I want you to ask yourself, how do you picture Jesus? How do you picture him? Very, very likely, an image is coming to your mind that's similar to this very famous painting called by, uh, it's called The Head of Christ by Warner Smallman. It has been printed 500 million times, and it is of a very white Jesus. What's going on there, right? We're not interested in history right here. <laughs> like the person who's doing this painting is not interested in what historically is Jesus likely to have looked like. And by the way, this is part of why in our tradition we don't have any images of Jesus. We, we don't even try to uh, portray or picture him. Why? Well, one of the things you're going to commit to when, as soon as you try to draw a picture of Jesus is at least some ethnic profiling of the Savior, Unhelpful. He didn't, he's just simply not something that is revealed to us. Um, okay, sure. Right. Yeah, that's a great point. 
<laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, I think, we, I think you're right. I think we can have an idea, and I appreciate what you're saying there. That's right. Um, but the point is, um, how many of us know what a first century Jewish person looked like? I mean, I sure don't. And like I, I have you know, studied a lot of uh, ancient Near Eastern and uh, first century Jewish history. It's just something that's not available. Now, I, th I think you're right. Um, we can, we can be pretty sure he didn't look like the head of Jesus that Warner Smallman painted. <laughs> and that's my point, right? Um, but, yeah, we're, we're not able to, um, we, we cannot accurately portray what Jesus looked like. We simply, it's just not something revealed to us. And so we have to be very careful not to misrepresent him. And one of the ways we can misrepresent him in a very subtle way is to make him look like us, or whoever us is, whatever ethnicity we're talking about. Okay, so um, we don't want to um, think of ourselves or our ethnicity as the most important one. Here's another way in which this works out, um, and another, I think, problem of racism in our present time. And it is ignoring the work of God in other contexts, ignoring the work of God in other contexts. So I have a book in my library of church history, and it purports to be a general work of church history. It's not like Western church history or, you know, church history in Europe. It's just church history, an overview. Well, it's a little, little disturbing that in this book, it basically is exclusively about the church in the West. So you hear, you know, about all the, all the things we're very familiar with, uh, Church Council of Nicaea and, you know, the, the Middle Age Church and um, the Reformation and all that wonderful stuff. Really fantastic, important things that God has done in the West. But almost not a word of the absolutely enormous things that God did in the Eastern Church. And so there's this whole huge story of what God did in, in, in medieval period um, in Eastern church history. Um, but then beyond that, um, there's the enormous things God is presently doing in what's called the global south, um, Asia, um, Africa, um, South America, all over the place. God, like the gospel is just booming. Right? And if we, if we just assume that the story of the church is basically everything that happened in the Western church that climaxes in the church in America, right? and we think of that as the story of the church, do you see how that's a racist thing to do? That that's a, that's a narrowing of the work of God, and it's making ourselves to be central in a way that just isn't accurate, isn't, isn't faithful to the larger story of God's kingdom. Um, it's, a, it's a, like it's a subtle way of saying, yeah, maybe there may be some other stuff that happened, but like, what happened in the West is really the most important thing. Um, I'm sure we want to say that. I don't, I don't think we want to say that. Here's another way in which um, we see uh, racism in the present time. Churches remaining largely segregated in terms of ethnicity and so on. So a 2010 survey indicates that 12.5 churches in America are multi-ethnic, which means that no single ethnic group comprises more than 80% of the congregation. Now, I think we have to trade carefully here because, um, you know, there can be situations where, you know, if you're in a, a place where the populace is largely homogenous, well, yeah, <laughs> it's going to be a homogenous church. Like, okay. Um, we shouldn't feel like false guilt about that. But I think that that's not the whole story. And I think part of what's going on <clears throat> is racism. That people who go to a church where they're not the dominant ethnicity are not being welcomed like people who are of the dominant ethnicity. We have to ask ourselves, like we have to search our hearts here. Like, is that something that we have fallen short on? Too. And I'm going to get to your questions in a second, 
but I wanted to share with you, I'm aware of at least two situations where people have come to this church and have eventually left because they didn't feel welcomed. And they, they are people who are not of the, the dominant ethnicity. And we have to ask ourselves, like, why? Why didn't they feel welcome? I think this is a welcoming church. And I know you guys are very loving people. But why didn't those people feel welcome? And, you know, there's, everything's complicated. And uh, maybe it's just their impression or whatever. But maybe not. Right? And we have to ask ourselves, like, are we as welcoming to everybody who comes through this door, regardless of the initial way in which they, they may strike us as being different from us? Um, do we have a problem with this? We have to ask ourselves that and ask ourselves whether or not we're being faithful to the love of neighbor. So did I see your hand? Yeah. Right. There's a lot of cultural differences. Yeah. yeah. Some of that culture differences, the differences that may have sprung mm-hmm. out of some of these, this poisoned well of mm-hmm. that we still reference, but probably it could be too hard or too, or too big to change. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, you know, there, there are like cultural factors at work and where you choose to go to church, right? Um, uh, we don't want to ignore that fact. And the fact is, like, this is a church in the United States of America in the 21st century in this particular, you know, suburban community. So, like, there's going to be, like, you know, ways in which our just general culture plays a role in just how we relate to each other and everything. Um, sure. But at the same time, like, we are beyond that, right? We're a bigger institution than just sort of a cultural institution. We're something founded on the, on the rock of Jesus and all the good stuff I shared last time about um, the unity of humanity just creationally, and then we're going to talk in a moment about the unity of humanity in a much deeper sense, the unity of the church um, across cultures, across languages, across across ethnicities um, in Jesus and in the Savior. So, yeah, did I see your hand, Anna? could be a factor of it, yeah. I guess I'm just trying to focus it on the, the key issue of being welcomed, right? Like people coming, expressing interest in you, wanting to get to know you, including you. You know, that's what I'm trying to draw our attention to. Did I see your hand, Doug? Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that. And uh, I appreciate what you're saying. Like, there's a lot of. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Right, so like I said, at the, as I was sharing this example, there's a lot of factors, right? Um, and there's ways in which you know, people bring expectations that obviously we can't control. And, um, and yet, I, I'm just asking us to reflect on how, is this maybe something that is invisible to us that we need to, that we need to make visible? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Um, I feel like part of what you're saying is kind of like what was mentioned last week, the, the struggle with my use of the term racism. Some people don't like the fact that I'm using that term. I, I, I guess I, I still feel like it's a useful term, whether you like it or not. Um, because I feel like I'm using it, yeah, in a way that's consonant with how it's typically used. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, so, I mean, again, I... I mean, you can call me woke or whatever if you want, but like, I, I feel like there, there is a thing called ethnicity. Um, there are like family groups within the larger race of the human race. And when we make judgments about people or treat people different on the basis of our perception of the different ethnicity, like that's a problem. And that's usually a problem that goes by the name racism. <laughs> So, one other thing, and that is in 1990, sometime, the great minister of defense, a woman named the extreme, Reggie Wright, spoke to the Wisconsin State Legislature, and he happened to point out that, hey, Hispanics worship in a different way. Hey, whites worship in a different way. Hey, blacks worship in a different way. But that doesn't make anybody wrong that there are cultural differences that exist in the world. Of course, he was meeting. Yeah, there are differences culturally across the world, and um, and then that includes how we worship. Like Doug brought up the you know the issue of music; it's a great example. Like, yeah, the music in churches throughout the world is going to be different, and you may gravitate to music that you connect with that other people don't. Yeah, Aaron. Not just take precedent, but actually like control that. Like that you you have distinct theologies for each ethnicity, um, which, is, which is just, just 
yeah, you're just you're really denying at that point the the sufficiency of scripture to teach us, right? And to actually pierce through our cultural understandings. And I think I saw Judy's hand. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and just to be aware that like there are so many biases that are just invisible to us. Like uh, Pastor Montgomery just gave me a great example of this. Like the, um, are you aware, all you right-handed people, of how right-handed a world it is? The left-handed people all know, right? But like every door you open, every desk you sit at, you know, I mean, I, I'm sure there are a million examples I'm not even thinking about because I'm right-handed. But like, scissors. yeah, scissors. Yeah, all kinds of things where it's just sort of like the dominant part of the human race, which is right-handed, has made a right-handed world. And it's just not, not something that we're we're aware of, most of us, right? And so, like, becoming aware of the ways in which we, um, we, we have these things that, that are distinguishing things going on in, in the world around us that, that are not always immediately available to our senses, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's not liberal or woke or conservative or anything to notice differences about people. We should yeah. not in any way be colorblind. Yeah, that's right. We should celebrate all different things. We should celebrate that like, immensely. Yeah, it's a um, beautiful part of his not, creation. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with saying, oh, that is different from how I do it or something. You do it right. like it or whatever. Mm-hmm. The racism comes in when you assign value right. or, or make something a pejorative. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It's it's assigning a value on the basis of those those things, and it's also I think when we don't do our duty to love, um, that that is a problem. That that's the key problem I'm trying to point us to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, not very long ago at all, I mean, a person of a certain color made a claim to a white church mm-hmm. and then lynched mm-hmm. for other people. Yeah, things. been badly mistreated, that's right. And so the degree of someone feeling a discomfort, mm-hmm. um, I mean, there might be a lot of us in here who walked into an area where they're the only person of their own color. Mm-hmm. And Yeah. Um, however, it doesn't happen to the majority of us very mm-hmm. often. Um, I mean, I've had friends that have shown up to my birthday party when I was little and said, you know what? I'm the only black kid here. Mm-hmm. And that recognition of that, that yeah. sudden, I'm uncomfortable mm-hmm. because there's a history that's not that long ago that's, right. that's been passed on from my grandma or from my parents that mm-hmm. taught me. Yeah, there's Most been. Of these people might look at me and hate me. Right, there's been wrong done in the past and that is definitely it really didn't at work. You know, there's like an empathy uh, That's right. that needs to come along and maybe even overreaching, over, you know, maybe even overwhelming. Like, I really am not feeling this way yeah. towards you. That sense of assurance of love. And, yes, yeah. yes, because you just. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. Um, I want to talk about the hope of the gospel uh, before we get to the end here. So I hope you don't mind if I press forward, but I really appreciate your comments. I did want to share one other 
example of a failure to love our neighbor that, again, is sort of one of these things where this is something that's subtle. Um, it's not the egregious forms that racism has taken, but it's, it's real. And it's this idea of putting people in a narrow box simply because they're not of the majority ethnicity. So two examples of this. I had a seminary prof um, in, in seminary um, who's a church history prof, excellent, excellent professor. And he was Korean, and he said he often gets this question uh, when he says that he, is a, that he is a church history professor. They say to him, oh, so you must be studying Korean church history? Right? And do you see how that's like a narrowing of what he would be interested in simply because he's Korean? Oh, you must be interested in Korean church history. Or this is another one. This is an example that I did. And again, this is just sort of like one of these places where I just am so ashamed that like I, I do this. I put people in boxes. But I had a professor at Wheaton who was a, on, on faculty with me. And we were just acquaintances getting to know each other. And I learned that he was a music prof. And he was a black um, uh, music prof there at Wheaton. And I said, oh, do you do drums? And see, there's, again, there's a, like that thing of just sort of like putting somebody in a box, assuming that that must be what you're interested in, as opposed to the whole wealth of what is music, right? And of course, as human beings, as image bearers, everything that is of, of interest to an image bearer is of interest to everybody of every ethnicity, right? Like there's a, there's a breadth that we should allow for everybody and not putting people in those boxes, assuming things about them simply because of our narrow, um, sometimes invisible understandings that we bring to the table. So we have to understand that race is a socially constructed thing. It's an ever-changing category. Um, as Christians, we need to call into question the very idea of race. We need to become self-aware of how it's affecting us um, and I want us to just pause and just think about like the problems I've listed above. Those are both individual acts of, um, some of them, individual acts of failure to love our neighbor. Um, some of them are much bigger. Some of them are what we could call systemic. Um, things that span um, and, uh, you know, entire churches or entire cultures um, that we need to become aware of and fight against. And we have to own it. We have to say, yes, we have made great progress in America since the 1800s. But we still have a long way to go. And how would you think it would feel to be somebody who is, in this present day, a victim of racism? How would, you, how would it feel to you to have somebody say to you, racism isn't a problem anymore? Or bringing up racism is divisive? Like, that's not helpful <laughs> to people who've been hurt, right? Um, rather, we should acknowledge, yes, this is a problem. It's going to keep being a problem. Um, and we need to fight against um, not just individual acts of racism, but also systemic acts. And actually, there's one systemic act I really want to call out, make sure you guys are aware of. There is a teaching that is around in the Reformed churches. Um, not this one, but um, it is alive and well. And it is called kinism. And kinism is this terrible idea that says that the races, which again is something I call into question, that the races, races should remain separate. In other words, it's ongoing, in this case, they would say theologically motivated segregation. We need to acknowledge that that is antithetical to what God has given us in his word and not have any toleration for that. Um, they're just saying, basically, yeah, they're just saying, like, you know, like the, the, the example I gave earlier of um, somebody who was in a church where a ruling elder was not of the majority ethnicity, and they're saying, I can't submit to this person. They should have their separate churches, and we have our separate churches, and we, and so, yeah, separate the races, right? Um, deeply, deeply problematic, and unfortunately, something that still is out there, right? Um, yeah. Exactly, 
Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's right. They would be against that. Yeah, and again, this gets back to like, okay, that we've made progress, but I don't think you said 100%, right? And so that's a problem, right? That's right. And this, this is going to continue to be an issue, just like racism is just like greed, um, you know, sexual morality, um, sinful anger. It's going to continue to be a problem until Jesus returns. But here's the hope, and I want to talk about the true hope. But first, I want to just as, um, you know, one of our duties as pastors is to warn you of false ideologies. I do want to call into question um, wokeness and critical race theory. I want you to be aware of it because it's one of those buzzwords out there. Um, I want to try to give it as specific a term, uh, you know, a uh, definition of it as I can. And this is not going to satisfy everybody. Um, in terms of like there's lots more to this, but I just want you to be sensitized to this. This is something that's big in our culture right now, and we need to be aware of it because um, it's a false solution. It's not the true solution to fighting racism. So CRT, what is critical race theory? This is on the back of your handouts. Um, it, it's the basic idea that the law and society in general is inherently racist. So there's like no escaping racism. It's just in, in, endemic to our society. Um, white people have created a society that inherently favors them. And every white person is guilty of racism simply by being white and receiving the privileges of being white. And to be woke is when you wake up to this and you realize, wow, I didn't realize because I'm white, I must be racist. And um, waking up to just the systemic, broad-reaching um, racism all around us. And it means you become sensitized to how racism is everywhere. And so what, what does CRT says we should do? Well, um, here's an interesting quote that Albert Schweitzer um, said actually a long time ago. Um, at, and they wouldn't say it this way now, but um, this is certainly um, the, the, the sympathy or the, you know, the idea. Um, a heavy guilt rests upon us whites for what the whites of all nations have done to the colored peoples. When we do good to them, it is not benevolence, it is atonement. And so wokeness favors this idea of reparations and legally enforced anti-racist measures, um, including forced redistribution of wealth to produce equality among the races. You notice on the same that I always put races in quotes because you know, I think it's a very problem problematic category. So you know, there's much more to say um, here. Um, there's, you know, uh, this is a big idea that is very, very big, especially in the academy. What can we say in response to this in light of the word? First, it's a reductionistic idea of sin. Like, sin under CRT is all about just this one form of one race oppressing another race. There's no sense of like, hey, do you realize, like, there are much more serious sins, including our failure to, to worship the one true living God that we need to deal with. And of course, this, when, when racism is real, when there is real oppression, that is a serious sin. But God is missing from CRT as if um, offending him isn't that big a deal. Um, it also depends on you know, these very problematic categories of whiteness and, and just races as being distinct. And it promotes anger and prejudice against white-skinned people instead of forgiveness. There is no gospel in CRT or wokeness. You are simply guilty, and there's no way out. You just need to say, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty, I'm guilty. And this is where I find Vodi Bakum at the end of his uh, book, beautiful statement <laughs> against this. Um, Bodhi Bakum, um, he was um, uh, in America. Now he's teaching in Zambia. And he, he's a black man, African-American Ameri African man. And he talked about his experience going to Africa and just thinking about his, his story, the story of how did, I, you know, how did I get to America? What was the story of my ancestors in America? 
and the fact that it was a story that involved slavery, right? And listen to what he says here. By God's providence, he had brought me back to Africa to bless the descendants of the people who sold my ancestors into slavery. So I forgave. I forgave the Africans who took my ancestors' freedom. I forgave the Americans who bought and exploited them. I forgave the family that replaced my identity with their German name. So he has the name Bauckham as a German name, right? Um, took away whatever the name was that he had, uh, his ancestors had, and gave, him, gave them this German name. I just forgave. I did not harbor any ill will. I did not feel entitled to any apologies or reparations. By God's grace, I recognized that providence had blessed me beyond my ancestors' wildest dreams or my own. I couldn't help but remember Joseph's words. As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people should be alive as they are this day. Genesis 50, verse 20. And I just love that, uh, like, very anti-CRT statement. <laughs> that it just say, says, look, have I been wronged? Have my ancestors, ancestors, ancestors been wronged? Yes. I forgive because of the gospel. And I'm not going to harbor anger against people who look differently from me. I'm not going to like, demand you come out here and you confess for all the things you've done. Right? <laughs> like, I'm not going to say, oh, you guys stole this. Um, your, your forefathers stole this stuff from me, so now you guys have to pay me back. Just forgives. Pursues reconciliation. Pursues love. I think that's beautiful. And I think that's what, unfortunately, is missing in a lot of CRT um, language. So there's a lot more I could say on this. I do want to make sure I talk about not the counterfeit solution, but the, you know, the solution God gives us in the gospel. But do you have any questions about CRT or how, how does this interface with what you're experiencing day to day? And um, any, Anybody have any thoughts on this, questions about it? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, and the, the great, um, so the question is, can we relate critical race theory to just critical theory and its roots in Marxism? And um, a really great um, overview of this is in Carl Truman's book, um, uh, Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, where he basically traces um, how did we get to where we are today? In his case, he's talking about issues of gender, but he's just pointing out that like, there's this basic narrative that Marx gives us of um, one class oppressing the other class and everything is about power. And in Marx, it's the, the pre predominant category is economic differentiation, so the rich oppressing the poor. Um, what critical race theory is saying, yeah, basically same narrative, except it's one race, again, problem, right? Um, but one race up exploiting and oppressing another. And so the, the answer that critical race theory is giving is the same thing as what Marx is giving. Um, you know, rise up and demand your rights kind of thing. Um, demand equality. Um, and and I, what I'm trying to say is that Basic narrative is not what God is giving us in the gospel. So, yeah. Also, the major difference there is that you can't, you can become rich, or the rich can become the poor. You, you cannot change your race. That's a great point. So, yeah. The there, I, I would say that the massive difference between those two periods because mm -hmm. anybody is the rich or anybody is the poor, I mean, that's all relative. Race yeah. is not relative in our country. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, ethnicity is more fixed. I mean, people try to say, I identify as, you know, another ethnicity or whatever, but yeah, if you're right, it is much more fixed than, than wealth. Yeah. yeah. Okay, right. Yeah, so inherent to having power um, is, is there's, there's going to be racism in, if you have power, and you can't. Um, there's like a, it's like a victim narrative, right? You, you have to be on the bottom 
you have to be oppressed to be able to say I'm in the rights um, here and I'm, I'm the one being afflicted by racism. So Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so lots of issues with this. Um, and this is something that is it's big. Um, it's something that is I think one of the biggest things is is that it tends to oversensitize us to these matters. Um, where we start thinking about other ethnicities all the time. Um, and being like hypersensitive to, oh no, am I going to do another microaggression? Um, these kinds of things. And instead of just saying like, here's this other image bearer, how can I love them, right? And here's how the gospel brings us to that place, where we really are focused on other people as people and loving them. And it's what Jesus did for us. He died not just for Israel, but for the elect across every tribe and tongue. And that includes the guilt of our racist acts, the ways in which we've shown ungodly partiality um, or you know, wrong kinds of partiality against people. So that's carried, it's taken care of. That's part of why Bauckham can forgive, right? He knows he's been forgiven and therefore he can forgive others. Um, what's, the, what's the great um, you know, parable about you know, how much um, you know, the, the, the king forgives like a billion dollars to one of his servants, right? What's that pointing to is, well, now go and forgive the little tiny debt that you owe to the, your fellow, fellow servants, right? Um, God forgiving us is what enables us then to forgive others. And, and there's an there's a actual, like, redemptive reality that grounds and gives us hope that, um, just like we were talking about, like when Jesus returns, this is all going to end. This is going to be over. And it is what he became in his resurrection. Jesus became the new and better Adam of a new humanity. He is the head of a new redeemed human race. And that human race involves every tribe and tongue, every ethnicity. And he is not only, rec this is so, so wonderful because this is like so, so much the answer to so much of our struggles in this present time. He has reconciled us not just to God, but to each other. So that, like, objectively, we are one people, and we are reconciled to every other Christian, no matter what their background or nation or whatever. It just doesn't matter. Like, where, wherever you go and you find another Christian, you are looking at another brother or sister in Christ. Right? And so... He has reconciled people of warring ethnicities to each other. He's broken down, as Ephesians 2 says, the dividing wall. And so now we, the church, in Christ, are objectively one people, one nation, one redeemed race, 1 Peter 2, 9 through 10. And, of course, the beauty of this, as was just mentioned, is that doesn't mean that we now become colorblind and ignore the fact that there are these ethnic dis distinctives. Like the one gospel is proclaimed in Acts 2, not in one like new unified language, right? But in all these different languages, right? He, he recognizes there that there are people from all these different nations there in Jerusalem and he gives the one gospel in those different languages. Or Revelation 7, 9, when we are all gathered together in glory, we will still have... The, the, the heritage and the background that we have, a great multitude, no one could number, from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and the Lamb, praising the triune God together, and praising God together as equals. I love this verse in Isaiah 19, and if you, if you can kind of transport yourself to, the, to ancient Israel and think about how much they had been afflicted by Egypt and by the Assyrians, you can just say, like, this is an amazing verse. Blessed be, God says, Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So there he's giving to the sworn enemies of Israel the titles that were previously reserved for Israel alone and saying, those people, 
I recognize them. I want, Joan, I want you to go, I want you to go to the Ninevites, those Assyrian guys. And I want you to tell them about the, the coming judgment so that they might repent and might believe. Um, that is a beautiful thing. And what is God doing here? He's not um, trying to erase all of those ethnic distinctives. Yes, there are some parts of cultures that are based on sin, that are against God's law. And those things need to die. But there are many, many cultural differences that aren't. Um, there's, there's not a sinful difference. So um, God's solution in the gospel is to remember our reconciliation to God and to each other and to embrace that, to live that. Like if you, this is, this is basically the entire Christian life. Here's who you are in Christ. Now live as who you are in Christ. Ephesians 1 through 3, here's who you are in Christ. Now Ephesians 4 through 6, in light of this, live it. So I'm saying to you, here's the answer to racism that Jesus has given. God has reconciled you, not just to God, but to one another of every tribe and tongue. Therefore, love. Love and treat as fellow equals, fellow heirs of the grace of life, people of all backgrounds, no matter how different they may be from you. A few other applications. Don't put people in boxes based on their appearance. Expect great things from all God's image bearers. Speak up against racism when you see it. Call it out. And I want to speak especially to um, our young people. Like, you guys will sometimes see, um, you teenagers, you will see people making fun of another person simply because they're different. You need to say something. Say, hey, we don't do that. You need to be the one who stands up with your friend and says, look, we don't, we don't treat people uh, differently just because they look differently from us. That's not right. But in, and then the final point is, don't dwell on racism as this incurable evil. I think this is one of the most horrible things about CRT is that it's actually inflaming all of these antagonisms because it's just like all the time, look, 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 grievance, 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 grievance. No, embrace the gospel that there is true forgiveness and hope and reconciliation. And now live that, extend it. Don't, don't like downplay the fact that there is still real racism and that we need to deal with that. We need to repent of that. But then once you've dealt with it, you've asked forgiveness, you've repented, you move forward and you love and you forgive the people who have wronged you um, because that's who we are as, as Christians. So have some time for discussion. Any, any questions or thoughts? As we're dealing with this challenging issue. Yeah, Dan? So, is cultural appropriation bad? Is cultural appropriation bad? Yeah, meaning, like, I've heard that, you know, you know, take those terms, like, you know, you seem, like, especially when it comes to jokes, and I'm thinking of, of, of joking. You want to talk to two, three people equally, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes, like, I may say something to a friend, and then, like, the an audience group in the same way, and I make fun of these characteristics, you know, mm -hmm. and then, Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that if I understand your question, you're like, should I adapt how I act based on my perception of the other person's culture or? Um, Ethnic background. But is it bad if I address more of the racist Tiana, you know, and or you know, or yeah. Yeah. I mean I think that again I just point us back to love of neighbor. Do unto others as they would have you do unto them. Um, like would this would this communicate love? Um, does this honor them and honor their culture? Um, the way I would want them to honor me. Um, so I, I feel like if that's your attitude of just like, I want to bless other people as co-heirs with, you know, the, of the grace of life, you know, and even if they're not a Christian, uh, as a fellow image bearer, I think that'll help us. And I think that'll prevent us from, because um, we don't want to like trivialize. We, we don't want to be trivialized. So we don't want to trivialize somebody else's culture or um, kind of 
um, make a mockery or impersonation. Um, like most of the time when I've heard people do impersonations of me, I'm usually offended. <laughs> Sometimes I laugh if I can, if I have the grace to laugh at myself. But uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, uh, other thoughts? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Um, one of the stories that I think is very relevant in the Old Testament is the name of the leper. He yeah, that's a great example. Yeah. So she was taken by force. Her family was likely slaughtered. She was abducted. She's not even named. And so she essentially, according to CRT, has so many of these intersectional values, yeah. you know, landing right on her. She right. was a child. She was female. Mm. She was of a minority religion. And she was a slave. And she was a slave. Yeah. And so, but what did she do? What type of behavior did she model? She saw that the person who likely had killed her family was somebody who was a general who answered to authority, mm -hmm. who was suffering with leprosy. She did not pray to God to finish him off or to make yeah. his death painful. Right. She said, there is somebody back in my hometown who can help me. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, I see that as a Mexican thinking, okay, the minority in any sense of the word, whether it's mm -hmm. ethnically, intellectually, whatever, this is my job as a Christian, to bless those whether or not they like me or hate me or anything. You mm -hmm. know, and the idea that somehow I should be offended because somebody doesn't like me because of my race or ethnicity, you know, that, that should be subordinated to my faith. Why, you know, I, I think it's unchristian for somebody to get mad because somebody dislikes me because of their race, but not because of their faith. My faith is far more important to me than my ethnicity. That's right. You know? Yeah. And then just real quick, going off of what was just mentioned mm. about cultural appropriation, um, I feel that the Bible teaches that all beauty is God's beauty. Mm. It is not ours. Mm. And so just how all truth yeah. is God's truth does not belong to any one ethnic group, any one school of thought. Yeah, that's right. It's the same thing with that. And different ethnicities become offended because they have invested these, med these modes of beauty with their oppression, with their grievances, with their history. Yeah. And those are legitimate conversations to have. Mm -hmm. But to laud something as beautiful and to want to mimic it, yeah. I don't feel is in any way inappropriate. No, that's a great that's point. That's a way of saying, I appreciate this. I'm mimicking it because it's something that is worthy of being repeated and being represented. Yeah. Yeah, you think about the history of music and all the inter interweaving of different streams because of that respect of beauty. Um, who would want to like say that's a bad thing, right? Um, yeah, excellent. Thank you. Um, well, it looks like we're. Yeah, go ahead. I, I just want to affirm you and your attack on this topic. I don't think that'd be easy. Um, but what I know of you, Pastor Montgomery, I would not. There's no one else that I would rather hear teach on this topic than you too. Thank you, brother. Because of what I know of you both in terms of your commitment to God's word, and you're looking at this through the lens of what does God's word say to, about us, and how can God's word correct us where we need to be corrected us, corrected, excuse me, mm -hmm. affirm us where we are on the right track. And and so I just again I oh, just thank you, brother. Say, you know, Lord, you know, praise God. Praise God. And, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't exactly the Sunday schools. I was like, yes. <laughs> but I do love you all, and I do want us to, to love our neighbor. So let's ask God to, to help us with that. Lord, we do, uh, we do need help. We, we struggle, Lord, um, with love. It doesn't come naturally. And um, when we look back on, on the past history of the church, and um, we see acts where we can really say, wow, that was not love of neighbor. Um, rather than looking down on past racist acts, instead, Lord, we see in our own hearts the same tendency, um, same tendency to defend ourselves, um, to make distinctions that are not loving, uh, to show partiality um, to our own advantage. And we do repent of these things, Lord. We don't want this to be what we're about as a church. We want to be a people who truly loves every person you send to us, um, every neighbor you bring through our doors, every neighbor we come across in our daily life. We pray that we would honor and love them 
as fellow image bearers, and um, that we would treat them with the dignity and respect and, and honor that they deserve um, according to your law. And that, Lord, we would also um, do all of that with hope. That, Lord, we would not fall prey to this narrative of just um, the, the idea that racism wins. Um, we know that's not true. We know that in Christ, um, you're in the midst of creating this new humanity where there's genuine love and, and um, beautiful diversity all at the same time. Help us, Lord. Um, help us to be attuned to the ways in which our culture is getting past our defenses and help us to stay focused on your word and on you. And we look forward to how you'll do that in us. We pray in Jesus' name.